Stand our feet, sing that song majestic. Hallelujah. 
we're going to slow things down this morning. Let's lift our voices in our hands and sing that song that my soul knows very well. You make your face to shine on me. Sing it. 
Jesus, I believe. And Jesus, I believe in you. And I God, thank God. We want to go before the Lord. We want to continue to pray uh, for a number of needs. We're praying for that uh, four-year-old boy, Brandon, that God's grace would be upon him. We're praying for our sister, uh, Pat, uh, Patricia, that God would just completely heal her, touch her life and minister in her uh, body and help her in every way. Her and Tom, we're praying for God's grace and favor upon the sale of Lyndon as we're into the home stretch. Uh, uh, it's uh, I I don't I think I told you uh, I spoke with uh, the people at Burndary. They've submitted all the paperwork. The town has all but approved it. It just uh, now it's the formality of the vote on the fifteenth. Uh, and so really uh, just pray everything goes well because we did have an eleventh hour disaster last time. Uh, and so eleven fifty nine I think it was actually. And so uh, we just want to pray. Uh, God's grace and hand would be upon that and all that would be involved uh, there. We're praying for our upcoming revival that will start next week with Patrick Johnson. I want to believe God to move and help us there just for God's grace and glory to help us in that time speak to lives uh, and hearts. Uh, we're praying also for God's hand upon our leadership churches uh, we're praying for Prescott, our mother church, uh, Pastor Greg, Pastor Jesse, the entire staff, God's grace and hand there. We're also praying and believing God for the Toronto church, the Lavallees, and uh, all the transition that's going on there, believing God to help them. Also praying for uh, the Yufginis will be uh, changing over this uh, uh, weekend. Uh, uh, they're uh, going to be going back into the mother church, and so uh, their children were here with us, and so just want to pray for them this weekend for a smooth change in the acts uh, and uh, God's hand and grace there. Praying as well for our leadership churches on Cape Cod and in uh, um, Jacksonville, North Carolina, praying also for our baby churches, our outreach churches, uh, Syracuse, God, uh, to help them find a building, praying for Brockport, uh, praying for Greece, fruit that would remain, uh, and God, just grow glory there. We're praying uh, for our congregation, God's favor, those that prayed over the weekend, we're going to hear a couple of good reports, uh, those that were witness to, those who heard the gospel, praying that God's grace uh, glory his seed would be established in their lives uh, his word would help them uh, bring them to uh, salvation and repentance we're praying uh, for god's glory to move and just bring revival in rochester we god knows we need it our city desperately needs it uh, also praying uh, for pastor frank luna as well as sister connie campbell for healing in their bodies how many of you have needs in your in your life Speak them out. Lift them up. We're going to believe God for great things uh, this morning. Uh, I'm going to ask if uh, Logan would come and seal us in prayer. Let's go before the Lord Jesus. Father, right now, God, we're asking you, God, for every need, uh, life and heart, God, uh, more that you would minister in your spirit uh, and by your word, God. We're asking you by the blood of Jesus Christ for these needs. God, we're praying, God, for healing virtue, God, right now. 
upon these that we've lifted up, God, Frank Luna, God, that Connie Campbell, God, believing you to move and minister, God. God, we come before you, God, this Sunday morning, God, we are asking, God, that you would move, God, on this building, God. We're believing you to fulfill, God, the words, God, that you've spoken about this congregation, Lord. Fill this building front to back, side to side, all the way down the hall, God, with people from all over the world, all over Monroe County, God. We're believing you, God, for creativity, innovation, Lord. We pray, God, that you would continue, God, to bless our efforts, God. Bless our help, God. Help us, God, in this season, God, of autumn, God, as we move, God, into the winter, God. I pray every single person, Lord, that we talk to, God, at the last two outreaches, God, you would, God, leave a mark on their heart. You would draw them back to this place, God. We thank you for everything that you are about to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank God. Take a moment, greet one another, share the victory. Praise the Lord Jesus. We want to welcome you out to the Potter's House. It is our Sunday morning service. We're very glad that you're here with us. Really do count it a privilege and excited for what God is going to do. We just want to let you know a couple of things. Of course, tonight we'll be back at 6 o'clock for our Sunday evening service. Prayer meeting at 5 o'clock. And then uh, uh, also Wednesday evening we'll be here at 7 o'clock. Uh, and a prayer meeting at 6 o'clock for... Uh, that midweek service. Then, just going into November, just want to remind you, we will be having revival with Patrick Johnson, uh, the 6th through the 9th, Monday through Wednesday, Sunday through Wednesday. Uh, really looking forward to that. It's going to be a great time with our brother. And so, uh, it's every um, Sunday, both services, 1030 and uh, 6 o'clock, then Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at 7 o'clock, uh, and so look forward to that. Uh, we'll be continuing on our Sunday school. Uh, we're uh, getting close to wrapping that up. Uh, 9.30 Sunday morning, uh, the fruit that the Spirit produces. We'll be having our final 180 in Linden on the 12th, and so uh, it will be our last official gathering there. Uh, we There's a few things we have to pull out after the music scene, the chairs that we'll use, some of the equipment, as we will be closing uh, the uh, the 15th, that Tuesday, we will be uh, having uh, the, they'll have the meeting, the city meeting, 
It's all but rubber stamped at that point, uh, and we'll begin our closing process on that on the 16th, uh, and the lawyers are ready to go. Everybody's excited for that, uh, and so uh, Burn Dairy, they're expanding rapidly. We had looked at the river's edge, which was another party house, which would have been out of the pan and into the fire disaster building. They've torn that down uh, and, uh, and uh, moving forward with that. And so they're excited to get moving on that project in East Rochester as well. And so it's going to be great. So remember our last music scene, the 12th, uh, maybe our last time in the building. So if you get a little emotional, I understand. And so I, uh, I'll be rejoicing. Anyway, uh, in the third, uh, Sunday morning, the 13th, uh, in our Sunday morning service, Pastor Adam Dragoon will be with us. Uh, that evening at 4.30, we're going to have serious men. That will be, uh, as for now, in the conference room, that what uh, you know is the children's church room. On the 18th of November, we're starting our Bible studies. And so if you want to be a part of that, I'm just asking that you sign up so they will know how many to anticipate coming to their Bible study. There is three lists. There's one to the east, one to the west, and one to the north. And so if you uh, just put your name on that, that would be a great, uh, great blessing. The team to Puerto Rico, the 1st through the 8th of December. And uh, if you want to be a part of that, you can also sign up the issues of all the ticket detail is there on the flyer, as well as there's really only one flight into Ponce. And so uh, please make a note of that. And then also on the 11th of December, we will be having our baby dedication. As I mentioned, uh, it is a year almost. It would be the 12th, but it would be uh, 52 weeks ago that Pastor uh, Evangelist Ernie Toppin prayed for some people to get pregnant. And uh, so, uh, and it happened. And so, and then, then you get the reputation for the, being the evangelist that gets all the girls pregnant, but you don't really want to explain that, but you have to sometimes. And so, Make a note of that. And the 9th of, through the 13th of January, the Prescott Bible Conference. Amen. That's all the announcements we have. We want to hear a couple of reports, what the Lord did over the weekend. Yanni's going to come and tell us about the pumpkin carving contest, and Brian's going to come and tell us about the trunk or treat. For you, oh, those of you who didn't know, um, a Friday night we ended up doing a pumpkin carving contest. It was our very first one ever here in uh, Brighton, and I think honestly in Rochester. We had a wonderful time. We had uh, three visitors from the local area. We also had one of our pioneer pastors uh, bring uh, two of their people over. We had uh, such an amazing time that we we gave out some prizes. There was very creative people out there. That, um, believe it or not, um, the one from Switzerland got the first place, which, you know, round of applause for that. <laughs> it was a wonderful time, and I, uh, I want to take this time to say thank you to all those who truly did invest in time and, and, and really did rally to, to make this happen. Pastor preached a sermon about rallying behind some, you know, outreach ideas and I tell you, that sermon was powerful because that's exactly what this congregation did from all the women that helped decorate to the flyers to the uh, uh, online website and everything from the people in the kitchen. Um, I want to say thank you to Pastor for allowing this outreach to happen. Uh, and, uh, uh, and a very huge thank you to my wife. I could not have done it without her. You know, from the decorations to everything, I... It would have looked like a dungeon if you walked in, if I decorated it, just saying. Um, but thank you to everyone who was involved. Um, by the end of the night, we did not have someone specifically raise their hand for salvation, but I got a text message saying that there was a man there that was a backslider. He is, he is family, but the thing is, is he said that he said a prayer of salvation that night, and he got his heart right with God which is the very most important thing and the drive of why we do what we do. So let's give God all the praise for that one that made the decision that night. Thank you, everyone. Good morning. Um, all right, so that was Friday night and Saturday. 
we did what's called a trunk or treat. And a lot of people, what they did was decorate their trunks. We had bounce house, a lot going on uh, last night. It was a very good outreach. Me and Patrick were talking about it. A comment that the, uh, the police officer made when I was talking to him is, they love when they get invited to this type of stuff because when they go to the school events and stuff, they feel non-welcome. And so they were really appreciative of the church's love for them. So they definitely recognized that. Firefighters were there. It was great. Altar call, people heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why we do this. And, and especially just building relationships. They stuck around and we, we talked to them and just shared the gospel with them one-on-one -on -one conversations. And that's what it's about, building relationships. And so by the end of the trunk or treat night, we did see one lady give her life to Jesus Christ, made a decision to live for God. These seeds planted, we are going to believe that all, even though nobody prayed maybe there last night, but that the seed was planted and, and we know that that will grow and God will do what he does. So let's give God praise for that. Amen. Two, two uh, outreaches that lessons were learned on, and we will be working them through. Just want to remind you also, if you're in the play, there'll be practice on Tuesday. And if uh, you've gotten a text from Logan about Monday night, um, you, you know that. But uh, general practice on Tuesday evening for the play. Amen. We're a busy church. We're doing lots of things, reaching into the community. We're trying new things. With our new building, our new generation, a new level in our church, if you will, uh, with lots of babies around here and, and uh, people busy with that. And uh, one guy walked in this morning, uh, one father, and I looked at him, and I'm like, tired? And he goes, oh, no, actually, it wasn't that bad. He goes, I just always kind of look like this. I'm like, well, that's what, and I was reminded of a guy who had twins, a guy I worked with, he had twins, and twins are four times more work, he say. Yeah, it was a rough night. One was up till three. We got him down, and the other one at 3.30 woke up. <laughs> anyway, you know, put the gun down. <laughs> it's going to be okay. And so, you know, but the reality of, of uh, just the busyness and to see the blessing and the favor on our church, just some great contacts last night. And so you uh, be excited for what God is doing, and you help us by your ties, your pledges, your offerings, besides. Corey, would you ask God's blessing on the gift and the giver? Lord, oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, oh Lord, how majestic is your name. platform workers, musicians. Hebrews chapter 2, if you have your Bibles. Hebrews chapter 2, we're going to look at the end of that chapter this morning. Uh, there was a uh, man in history, some of you may know, he was notorious for his uh, robberies. His name was Black Bart. And they called him Black Bart because he dressed in black. He was actually a white man, but he dressed in all black, right up to his face. No one ever saw his face. Black Bart, very interesting. He robbed stagecoaches. He, he tormented the Wells Fargo Company from 1875 to 1883. And in those eight years, I think he robbed 29 different stagecoaches. What was very interesting about the, his method is he was very intimidating in his looks. Dressed all in black, he would come out, no one ever saw his face. He never actually hurt anyone. He never actually shot or killed anyone. He never actually fired a shot. 
He would have no victim as far as person. He never took a hostage. And as a result, because they couldn't identify him, he never was pursued by a sheriff. But what was very interesting about Black Bart and his method is he used total intimidation. And he would get people to submit by fear. Fear is one of the strongest emotions that people have in their lives. And it can get you and cause you to do things you're not comfortable with, you normally might not do. It can cause you to react and keep you from blessing and destiny. Fear is an awesome emotion that is exploited by the devil. We're going to look in our text that Jesus wants you to be free from fear. Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 14, it says, Because God's children are human beings, made of flesh and blood, the Son of Man became flesh and blood. For only human beings could he uh, die. And only by dying he could break the power of the devil, uh, that, who had the power of death. Only in this way he could set us free from those who have lived as slaves to the fear of dying. For we, all, uh, for we also know that the Son of Man did not come to help uh, angels, but he came to help the descendants of Abraham. Therefore it was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us as brothers and sisters, so that he could be merciful and a faithful high priest before God, that he could offer the sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people, since he himself had gone through suffering and testing, that he may help us when we are being tested. He makes the statement that Jesus came to break the power of the devil, that of death, who over people who had been slaves to fear their entire life. In our text, it speaks specifically of death. People are afraid to die. It's fascinating people. Larry King, who passed away in 2021, he was a... Uh, uh, interviewer, worked on the CNN network for many years. He was obsessed with his death. In 2015 article, it says that uh, he was obsessed with his funeral. He smiles that he thinks that Bill Clinton might uh, be there, and then he uh, says, but I won't be there to see it. He has... Uh, he has had a heart attack, quadruple bypass, prostate cancer, diabetes, and seven divorces. He, at 77 years old, when the article was written in 2015, he was the oldest person working in CNN until they finally dropped him uh, because he blew an election where he said, how did we screw this up? And so... Uh, admitting that they actually had an agenda in it. They were real upset. Now they, they're blatant about it. He says that he had learned from... He learned from television the death of Osama bin Laden. He jumped to his feet and he said, I need to be on the air. But he realized he had nowhere to go. He says that when he would wake up every morning, he would read the newspaper, the New York Times, and the first thing he would read, the obituary. He was obsessed with it, this fear of dying. Now, we know as Christians, we have great hope. 
Revel, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 says, Now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know that what happened to the believers who have died so that you do not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe in Jesus, died and raised again to life, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. We know that there's... We many times know it in our head, the fact that as believers, we have great hope. But one thing that fear does is it erases hope. It tries to come against hope. This is why people were lost to this fear of death. They caused them to have no hope and change their actions. Fear does not have to be rational. Louis Pasteur, the man who invented the pasteurization of milk, it has nothing to do with the ministry. The pasteurization of milk actually had to, when he began to take uh, and begin to remove bacteria from the milk uh, that made it safe for people to drink, he had an excessive fear of shaking people's hands. He really was a germaphobe. And so he refused. It was... President Benjamin Harris and his wife, who were so intimidated by this newfangled thing called electricity that they refused to have it installed in the White House. That when they did install it, they refused to touch the switches. If there were no servants around uh, to turn off the lights, the Harrises simply went to bed with the lights on. They would not, they were afraid. It doesn't have to be rational. People have all sorts of fears and phobias. Uh, we know that uh, it changes behavior. When you're afraid, your behavior will no longer believe or what is necessarily true and right in front of you. 2 Kings chapter 7, verses 6 and 7. For the Lord had caused the Armenians to hear the clatter of speeding chariots and galloping horses, uh, the sound of a great army approaching. Uh, the king of Israel has hired the Hittites and the Egyptians to attack us. Uh, so they cried to one another, so they panicked uh, in the night, abandoning their tents and donkeys uh, and everything else, and fled for their lives. It wasn't logical. The king, they, they had surrounded the, the city of Samaria. The king had no ability to hire anyone. There wasn't internet, telephone, any way to communicate with these other armies. If he had, it would have taken weeks, if not months, from them to get there. There's nothing logical about it. But in their mind, fear gripped them, and they left everything behind and fled for their lives from an enemy that was never pursued. Pursuing. Fear changes our behavior. It causes us to not think logically. John 7, verse 13. This is the day of the feast. Jesus has gone to Jerusalem. And it says in verse 13, but no one had the courage to speak favorably about him in public, for they were afraid of getting in trouble with the Jewish leaders. They liked Jesus, but they were afraid. I mean, the cancel culture is not new. That's what, they, that's what they're afraid of. They're afraid of being canceled. It's not new. This, it's maybe bigger with the internet today and social media. But it's not new. They were afraid of being canceled. They're afraid. Well, what's everybody going to say? So nobody speaks positively about Jesus. There, it changes our behavior. It affects our minds. FOMO, the fear, missing out. My granddaughter, she, you know, she's only seven years old, but she suffers from FOMO really badly. Right, we, uh, you know, she, she's always afraid of missing out on this. People won't do anything because they're afraid of failure. Well, what if I do it and nobody likes it? 
Oh, well. You tried. People will do this in relationships. I'm, I'm afraid of being hurt again, so I'm, not, I'm going to build some walls. I'm not going to have a relationship. I'm not going to have friends. I'm not going to you know, venture out. I'm not going to put myself out there again. People are afraid past failures will come back and haunt them. Sometimes it's 20, 30, 40 years. People are afraid to live in reality today. So they get stoned. They check out. There are hundreds of phobias. There's pildo, uh, I'm going to butcher some of these, but there's peldophobia, the fear of being bald. Or a fear of bald people. There's areophobia, a fear of drafts. I can tell you most of Eastern Europe suffers from that. They think if the cold wind blows against your ear, you're going to be sick. There's chetophobia, the fear of hairy people. I think hairy people might be a little scary anyway. There's dextrophobia, the fear of things on your right side of your body. On and on it goes. That people are afraid and there's words for it. That's amazing to me. My favorite great word is trixodexophobia. Fear of number 13. People have these fears, and it changes them. Gideon was afraid, so he's hiding. Judges chapter 6, he's hiding in the wine craft, doing the wheat. He's not even using the right tools. Grape crushers don't make great wheat separators. It has this effect on us. And it filters the way we think and changes the way we act. It also has a physical effect. Asthma can be a direct result of a fear as a child. Fear can actually affect your physical body that people have had heart attacks. Adrenaline is released. The flight or fight feeling. It has an absolute amazing dopamines are released. Why people in the midst of fear will sometimes do crazy things. It'll affect your emotions, affect your physical, affect your mind. Not only that, it talks about in our text being a subject of slavery. That you become a slave to these. The word literally is bondage. It's a life not of one's choosing. It has the thought there, you know, a slave, you can picture this in your mind. They did not have freedom. They were told to do what they had to do. They were told to be where they had to be. They didn't have the choice. This is like bondages. We know that that is seen in people's behavior. In alcohol, cigarettes, video games, pornography, on and on the list goes, right? They're in bondage. They're bound by these things. They're taken in by them. They cannot be free without them. It dictates their lives. It steals your free will. But the devil also knows this, and he'll use it against us, even as spiritual. 1 Samuel chapter 11 is a fascinating story to me. It's Nahash. 
Nahash is the king of the Amorites. His name literally means the hiss of a serpent. He comes to the children of Israel and he says, I got a deal for you. I'll either kill you or I'll put out your right eye. And they said, give us a week. <laughs> and I can't believe it, but Nahash actually agrees to this. And he says, yeah, okay. I'll give you seven days. They sent messengers through. Saul rises up. He beats them. But the fact that they're considering this. You know, I don't know if you understand, but, you know, you lose an eye. It's, it's, it can be very life-changing. You can't fight well. Half a vision is not very effective. I know people with half vision. Right? They lose all of that. Your range in two eyes is something like 190, 195 degrees. See a little bit beyond one, you know, exactly 180. Go back a little bit. See your fingers. You lose one eye, you have 110 degrees of vision. You've lost so much. Because of the effect of just one eye, your nose gets in the way. You can't see over there. Some people, maybe they lose, anyway, never mind. That they lose this vision and they're considering, why fear? Fear would make them give in. Peter talks about the devil seeking as a roaring lion. I've heard, I, 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 I've I think I've shared with you, I, we went to the Poland Zoo right after, you know, this was shortly after independence. They'd broken off of the Soviet Union, and uh, they had a lion there, but his roar was, was lame. Oh. Wasn't this like strike fear, it was like strike pity in your heart, like this boy is sad. <laughs> he should be in Africa, and he's not there, and he's, he's really sad about it. But it, they would roar, strike hearts. There were two explorers one time. They were on a jungle safari, and they had come across a fierce lion that jumped in the road and roared. And, and one of them said, keep calm. Remember what the book said on wild animals? Stay perfectly still, and the lion's eye will be turned when he sees something else move. That guy said, his partner said, yeah, I hope he read the same book. Right? The lion's roar, tear, paralyze you. In the book, The Man-Eaters of Savo, which is a great book, I'd recommend it. Lieutenant Peterson uh, he's talking about how when the he, one time his gun, he borrowed a gun, it jammed. He was trying to get this lion, kill it. And the lion roared and one of the people took off and he said it saved his life because when that man moved, the lion went after him. Terrifying roar. Fear. This is what the devil wants to do. He wants to steal your free will. I fear. Matthew 10, 26 through 30. Don't be afraid of those who threaten you, for the time will come when everything that is covered will be revealed, and the secret will be made known to all. What I tell you, now in darkness, will be shouted abroad when daybreak comes. What I whisper in your ear, shout from the rooftops for all to hear. Don't be afraid of those who want to kill the body and cannot touch the soul. Fear only God who can destroy both body and soul in hell. What is the price of two sparrows? One copper coin. But not a single sparrow will fall to the ground without your father knowing it. The very hairs on your head are numbered. He says there's a spirit of fear that's going to come against every believer bringing this out, that there's going to be threats. Now, some of those will be external. They'll be, uh, you know, I mentioned in the Sunday school, there was a 
article recently uh, on Fox yesterday that uh, these kids were street preaching and there were these that were protesting and uh, you know and someone grabbed the Bible out of one of the young kids hand ripped it up uh, and then started eating the pages really weird really strange stuff intimidating stuff there's that kind of stuff that can happen and then there's the lies that the devil whispers in your head Pay your tithe, and you'll go broke. Witness, and they'll all hate you. Do what's right, and it's not going to work out well for you. The lies that hell will whisper in your ear to try to intimidate you Out of doing what is right. Fear will steal your future. People will be paralyzed. The children of Israel wouldn't go into the promised land. Fear had gripped them. The ten spies came back with the bad report, right? Giants in the land. We're grasshoppers in their sight. Bad scene, man. We go in, we'll be, we'll be devoured. No pro- So they ended up losing out 40 years. That whole generation lost out. Because of fear. Intimidated out. Never entered into the promises, the destiny that God had. Oh, they had God's provision. They had God's protection. They had God's presence. But they didn't have God's promise. Lot's wife. Fleeing Sodom and Gomorrah. Wicked city. God, the, the angels told them, this is what you're to do. Go all the way to Azora. Do not turn around. She does. It's turned into a pillar of salt. What am I losing? What am I, what would I lose? It'll steal your peace. Faith, a fear disturbs everything. living in Lithuania for the 11 years I did, I met lots of people who had grown up in the Soviet system. The Soviet system was all based on fear. Communism is based on fear. They promise utopia, they create fear. That's what they do. Every time. Dictators. There's 10 common things dictators do, whether you read about Napoleon, or Idi Amin, or Khrushchev, or Popa. There's common factors, and one of them is they work by fear. They work by intimidation. They steal the peace of society. Everybody's uptight. It's absolutely amazing, you know, and to get that mentality, you know, people would, the way they functioned. Second Chronicles 32, 18, and the Assyrian officials who brought the letters shouted in a Hebrew voice and gathered to all the people on the city walls, trying to terrify them so they would be easier to capture the city. He speaks in their language. I've mentioned before, I've been cussed out in Russian. I've been cussed out in Ukrainian. I've been cussed out in uh, Lithuanian, in other languages uh, that I don't understand. And it's like, yeah, whatever. You know, I I remember one guy, he he went off on me. He was speaking, he was definitely speaking Russian. He's just going off. And I'm like, yeah, same to you, buddy. I don't know what you're saying, but same to you, you know. If you're wishing me blessing and favor, which I don't think he was, but, you know, hey, good on you, man. Same to you. I have no idea what he was saying to this day. I don't want to know, because I don't think it was nice. And if he was talking about other family members, I definitely don't want to know.
It'll steal your peace. This is why, you know, perfectionism will steal your peace. You'll never be perfect. It has to do with pleasing others. Fear of being a lesser. In our text, it says that people were subject to this their entire lifetime. That generation after generation would come, and they were subject to fear. That changed their behavior, changed, stole their future, stole their peace, stole their will, and caused them to live a life displeasing to God. That's what our text is telling. And it says in our text that Jesus came to break that power. Or the good news is you don't have to live bound by fear. After 9-11, some of you, I know, it's amazing how many of you were born after that or were too young to remember. Because those of us who lived through it, it feels like it was not that long ago. And I know there are always an event in history. You know, they say the same thing of you remember where you were when you heard Pearl Harbor was bombed, if you were alive at that time. You remember where you, where you were when Kennedy was shot. I remember where I was when I heard that Reagan was shot. I was, only, I was only a freshman in high school. But I remember yeah, I was on the front stairs of the school. I remember it very specifically. It changed behavior for a little while. Right? People get afraid, and it binds them. It marks them. This is the thought here that is in our text. But the glorious news is brought through this, Jesus came to help you with your fear. Yes, he did come to die for your sins. That's very obvious in our text. It says very clearly that, therefore, he was made a high priest and that he could offer and take away the sins of the people. But it also says he became like us so that he could go through and have a nature like ours. Hebrews chapter 4 would talk about this a little bit more. Having a high priest that can identify with our weakness. That we're not just looking at a high priest that he, he's not in an ivory tower. He's been there. And that our text tells us he wants to help you with your fears. You don't have to live bound by them, whatever they may be. God wants to set you free, that you don't live a slave under that that changes your behavior, steals your will, and steals your future. Paul writes, and he says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, God has not given us the spirit of fear and intimidity, but of power, love, and of self-discipline. God wants to give us power, love, self-discipline. Help us in life. It was Nancy Reagan after Ronald was shot who made the statement to the press, I refuse, I refuse to live in fear. He said, it's not going to dominate my life. So the first thing you have to do when it comes to fear is you have to recognize that this is the problem. It's not the economy. It's the fear of losing out. Not the future. It's the fear of FOMO, it's the fear of missing out on something else. It's not the fear. I'm sorry, it is the fear that keeps you bound, not the circumstance. 
People make very irrational. I heard a very sad story. And what was amazing is they went back and found this woman. It was in the Congo. The tribal, I can't even begin to do, describe the, the Hutsis and the Tutus and there's other tribes that were involved. Many of you know about the Rwandan fiasco. But these tribes there, and one tribe was invaded by another, and this woman had a choice. She could either kill her own child or be killed. She chose to kill her own child. What was amazing to me is that she was interviewed by the BBC a year afterwards. The regret, the shame, and the guilt that was there because of this mother's decision at that time left her powerless and such. Fear is powerful, but God is more powerful. People will sacrifice their future through fear. That's why God wants to give you power. Power over the fear and circumstances. It says in our text that since he, is, he himself has gone through the same, or through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we're being tested. He's not going to leave you without help and without assistance. He wants to be there to help you and strengthen you in the times that you need it. God will never leave you or forsake you. Power is the ability to do what is right all the time. I'll say it again. Power is the ability to do what is right all the time. People will use circumstances and cues. I, I really didn't want to do that, but I was forced. At... Power is the ability to do what is right all the time. You can't blame circumstances. You can't blame the devil. You can't blame others. It's not going to work before God. We say it all the time in altar calls, don't we? Your friends aren't going to be there. You can't blame the devil when you get to heaven. He made me do it. It's not going to work, right? We know that. But somehow we think fear will justify it. God wants to give you power to do what is right all the time. Will you? Eh, maybe not. But he's been there. He understands. He can help you through it. Jesus did it. And as Hebrews 4 goes on to say, without sin. He wants to give us love. Love is a very powerful thing. John chapter, 1 John 4, 18. Such love has no fear. Because fear, because perfect love expels fear. We, if, we are, if we are afraid, it is the fear of punishment that shows us that we have fully not experienced his perfect love. King James, New King James, love casts out, triumphs over fear. Love is a very powerful thing. If you love God, you'll overcome your fears. There's incredible stories of people running into burning buildings to rescue loved ones. There's incredible stories of, uh, you know, um, um, parents uh, risking their lives for their children. Men risking their lives for their wives. Unbelievable stories of love. That, you know what, fear was there, but it kept them going. Very interesting, a couple of years ago, the Paradise Fire, as it became to be known as, in California. The city of Paradise was quickly overcome. There were a number of factors involved in it by an electrical fire that had started and they couldn't get to it because of the where, it, where it was and it burned out of control and consumed the town. 
wiped it out. The school called all the parents to come and get your children. There were t- about 20 children who they could not get a hold of their parents. And they stuck them on a bus. And they said, we're going to take them to another school. And as they were leaving, they put the kids on the bus, and the bus driver's like, you're going to leave me with these kids, and I don't know them. I need some teachers. Two teachers volunteered, got on the bus with them. Well, Paradise, part of the disaster of the fire of Paradise is Paradise is set up in the mountains. There's only like four roads in and four roads out of Paradise. And it was just a a disaster. It was... Uh, you know, they, they said it was for, you know, uh, newlyweds and people, you know, retired people. It was a cheaper place to live, but it was uh, very nice, but far away from everybody. And so as this bus driver is driving, he's stuck. They, people are not letting these kids out. I can't, I can't even grasp this, but people are afraid for their lives. So they're not letting, the bus got stuck and trying to make a left and nobody's letting him make a left. They couldn't make this turn and, and the kids are afraid. They're coughing. They're trying to get some water. One of the teachers said, the bus isn't going anywhere. I'm going to go see if I can get some water somewhere for the kids and came back with a couple of bottles of water that people would give, uh, but uh, it wasn't much. And then finally, this white pickup truck behind them cuts out in front of the bus and they're all upset at this man and then they realize it's the principal he's been following the bus since it left the school he cuts traffic off so the bus can get out of town you know jesus is just like that it's a great illustration to say you know what in your fears when you feel trapped jesus is right behind you he's right there that's what our text is saying He's right there to take care of you. He's right there to help you. He loves you that much. The thought of uh, self-discipline or some say a discipline, it has a sober mind or a sound mind. It has to do with the thoughts and the decisions, putting aside distractions, letting God help you. Robert Louis Stevenson said, keep your fears to yourself and share your courage with others. Fear is given strength through word. We'll never, I can't, don't you know, the ten spies spoke some words, destroyed a generation. Put the spirit of fear in their minds. They lost out. So how do we overcome fear? Well, I'm glad you asked, because our text gives us a cure-all. It says very simply, ask Jesus for help. Deep, I know. Thank you. Ask Jesus for help. That's what it says. That we can come to Jesus when we need help. Just ask him, Lord, I'm afraid of my, for my future. Lord, I'm afraid for the money. I'm afraid if I do what is right, this is going to play out. And maybe it will play out the way you fear, but God will take care of you through that. Well, if I do this or if I do, God will take care of you. That's the picture here is you ask Jesus and you come to him in faith and know that, you know what? He's been there. He knows he's going to take care of you. The wonderful beauty of our fellowship is we have altar calls. Is you can come to Jesus today and say, God, I'm afraid if I do what is right. I'm afraid if I do this. I'm afraid for my future. I'm afraid, you know, the election, the economy, the this, the that, the, the whatever. Whatever. Bring it to Jesus. Bring it to Jesus. Somebody had written in chalk on the parking lot, vote for Jesus. Uh, the problem is you can't vote for a non-American. Sorry. But the reality is you can believe him. 
that you and I can come to Jesus, the whole picture, being God's children, made of flesh and blood, humans that, uh, you know, dying, Jesus came to break the power of the devil to set to Jesus. Let God help you. He'll do a work, but you have to sometimes. I'm not saying it'll be easy. He says in our text, when we're tested, when, we're, when we go through trials, sometimes it happens. But we can come to Jesus and he can help us with any fear, any issue we have. We can put it at the throne of Christ. He's going to help us. Let's all stand. These altars are open. And allow people to find a place to pray. Worship God. Take your fears to Him. Love unfailing Overtaking my heart Take me in, I peace again. Fear is lost in all you are. And I would give the world to tell your story. you pray this morning because I believe God really does want to speak to people and help them because fear is horrible and I've been there I you know and I'll be there again we'll all be there again because that's we're human beings that's it's a natural tendency that we have towards this but I want to just help you pray I want you to say if you will father in the name of Jesus I'm casting my fears at your throne God, you know my circumstances. You know my testings and trials. You're going to help me. Father, I'm asking you right now, give me power. Give me love. Give me a disciplined mind that I may be that son or daughter that you have called me to be. And I thank you that you are going to help me and that you are at work in my life and in my circumstances, and I rejoice in that, in Jesus' name. Let's worship his name. Let's give him praise. Father, we love you. 
We thank you, God, that you are able, Lord, to move in our lives and in our hearts. Thank God. Thank God. Amen. So you remember that? It's a great portion of Scripture to read every once in a while because you know what? Conquer. It's like fear is like forgiveness. Like, yeah, you can forgive everybody, and then you're going to go out, and life's going to hit you hard sometimes, and it's going to be like, oh, yeah, <laughs> I got to do it again. And so you keep that in mind because God is willing to help us again. Amen. Good things ahead. We've got service tonight. Remember the practice for the play, Wednesday service, the revival next week. Take some flyers. Pray for those. If you've got any information on anyone this weekend, uh, give them a call. Pray for them. Let's believe God for good things. Uh, Aiden, would you seal us in prayer? And Lord bless you.